and uh, this is a panel that is going to consider the recent uh, presidential election in historical context. Uh, I want to say uh, at the beginning that one of our panelists, Mary Berry, uh, is likely to be a little bit late, but she will be here. Uh, she had There were some scheduling issues. I think a number of people have had various kinds of scheduling issues in the last few days. So our goal this morning is to frame the election in historical perspective. Uh, I'm hoping that this can become a regular feature of the AHA annual meeting, uh, or an every four years feature, obviously, uh, but part of a larger enterprise. Uh, some of you may know that, well actually let me ask, how many of you have seen on our website uh, the forums that we've had on the presidential debates I'm seeing some hands go up, but that's in part because some of the participants <laughs> in that forum are here. Okay, a few of you. Uh, and, and I could ask like, the participants who were here how they thought it went. But what we're trying to do is uh, inject more historical context, more historical thinking into public culture, into public affairs, uh, using our website, obviously, as, as the venue that's the easiest place for us to control in our annual meeting. Uh, but we'd like to do this as often and as widely as possible. Uh, we're encouraging all historians to, in any way you can, uh, whether it's in your local newspaper, through a blog, whatever, uh, to be helping the American public think historically more often uh, about uh, politics, public policy, public culture, one of the other things we've done uh, on our website is we've gathered all of the commentaries on Spielberg's Lincoln film by historians that we know of, uh, in one, links in one place that, that you can find. So this is, this is part of this larger enterprise. Uh, this, it, it stems from two rather straightforward assumptions. One is that historical thinking is valuable across all walks of life. And the second is that historians have something to say. Uh, in some ways, for me, it actually draws on, believe it or not, uh, freak, the Freakonomics book. Uh, in the sense that what those guys figured out was that economists had something to say about everything. <laughs> and they have successfully convinced the American public, large portion of the American public, <laughs> that what they call simply economic thinking is applicable to just about everything in our lives. And I deeply believe that that is even more true for historical thinking. So when we get our show on NPR, equivalent <laughs> to, to Dubner uh, there on Freakonomics, then I'll know that we've succeeded. So the guidelines that I've offered our panelists are actually very similar to the guidelines that we drew up for our forum on the presidential debates. Uh, guided by the belief that public discourse on any current topic benefits from historical context and historical thinking, we bring together professional historians to offer historically informed commentary. We, ask, we have asked all of our participants uh, to comment as historians, that is, to deliberate on how their understanding of the past can contextualize, in this case, the presidential election of 2012. We're, I have not asked my four colleagues here for absolute neutrality. I have not asked them to be reporters. But I have asked that they refrain from mere partisanship, not to mention polemic. So, in that sense, we are emphasizing our role as historians rather than pundits or partisans, despite the appeal of being either and both, and although the line also obviously blurs. We will begin with Laura Kalman, who is professor of history at the University of California at Santa Barbara, where she has been teaching since 1982. She's also been visiting professor at Yale Law School. Uh, I'm not going, for any of our panels, I'm not going to go through, if, if I went through the CVs of these four people, we would not have a chance to hear them. Uh, and in Laura's case, for example, the list of fellowships that she has declined is a wish list of fellowships for most of the rest of us to even be awarded. She's been the president of the American Society for Legal History, has written five books, uh, including Yale Law School in the 60s, uh, biography of Abe Fortas, and most recently, Right Star Rising, A New Politics, 1974 to 1980. Uh, 
Her numerous articles on legal education, law, and politics include such intriguing pieces as Eating Spaghetti with a Spoon, uh, Garbage Mouth, uh, Bible, Babel, and Boorishness. Uh, no polemics. No polemics, however, this today. Uh, and currently she's working on the long shadow of the Warren Court, LBJ, Nixon, and the making of the contemporary Supreme Court. Sean Wilentz will go second, speak second. He is the George Henry Davis 1886 Professor of American History at Princeton University, where he has taught since 1979. He is the author of eight books, the co-editor or editor of six more, I think I counted correctly. Uh, he has also co-produced a CD. His articles and essays have been uh, appeared in all sorts of academic, familiar academic settings, plus the New Republic, the New Yorker, the New York Times, the Daily Beast, the New York Daily News, Newsweek, U.S. News and World Report. So obviously, Sean is one of those colleagues whom I do not have to encourage to speak out more <coughs> as a historian in, in public culture. Most of these have been on political issues, but also a little bit on music and on baseball. The winner of the Bancroft Prize uh, and uh, his book, The Rise of American Democracy, uh, won all sorts of best books of 2005 awards. Will Imboden is assistant professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas since 2010 and also distinguished scholar at the Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law at UT. He has held senior positions at policy institutes in Washington and London, as well as the National Security uh, Institute and the State Department. He is the author of Religion and American Foreign Policy, 1945 to 1960, The Soul of Containment, uh, which won the Frank and Elizabeth Brewer Prize for the best first book from the American Society for Church History, and is currently working on the Cambridge Companion to Reinhold Niebuhr. Reinhold Niebuhr. Mary Frances Berry is the Geraldine R. Siegel Professor of American Social Thought and Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania, where she has been since 1987. She has also taught at the University of Colorado, Howard University, University of Maryland, Eastern Michigan University, and Central Michigan University. She is the author of 10 books, most recently Power in Words, the stories behind Barack Obama's speeches from the State House to the White House. Mary has 34 honorary degrees, uh, has been the president of the Organization of American Historians and the vice president of the American Historical Association. What's striking about Mary's CV is not just the number of activities that involve service to our profession, to our country, to the United Nations, uh, but the way she puts them on her CV, which is in a place of prominence that suggests a different attitude towards that kind of activity. Uh, from, from many of our colleagues, and which I especially appreciate. Uh, and uh, I suspect Mary doesn't remember this, but actually Mary was on the first, the very first AHA panel that I ever was on. Uh, <laughs> as I said, I suspect you don't remember, but I do. And it was, it was actually a wonderful experience, it was a wonderful conversation. It was, it was a panel on uh, Nick Lemon's The Promised Land. Yeah, in a big room, lots of controversy. I was young, that's right. <laughs> we all were at one time. So, I'm going to sit back and listen, and we're going to begin with Laura Kalman. Uh, each of our panelists is going to talk for about 10 minutes. We're going to see if there's conversation uh, among the panel, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Thank you. The day after the 2012 presidential election, I received a stern email from two close friends. It was time they declared that I stop obsessing over whether Obama was another Jimmy Carter. For years, I trumpeted the parallels between Obama and Carter, two people with little Washington experience who appeared from nowhere and became president at a time when the Republicans looked more of it. Even though, as an historian, I know that history does not repeat itself, and I cringe when any, whenever anyone cites Sagayana for the proposition that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, I fear that Obama's presidency might rhyme with Jimmy Carter's. 
The fear only became more acute after the sad events in Benghazi raised memories of the Iranian hostage crisis. But the fear always existed. Unlike Sean, I had become an Obama believer in 2004. But when Sean wrote this sentence about Obama in Newsweek oh, no. <laughs> in the summer of 2008, Sean articulated... <laughs> Sean, I never forgave you for that sentence, so that's okay. <laughs> Sean articulated my deepest political anxiety. Rejecting politics as usual, attacking Washington as the problem, promising to heal the breaches and hurts caused by partisan political polarization, pledging to break the grip that lobbyists and special interests hold. It's a really long sentence, isn't it? <laughs> Wearing his Christian faith on his sleeve as a key to his mind, heart, and soul, in all these ways, Obama resembles Jimmy Carter more than he does any other Democratic president in living memory. The parallels between Obama's Republican challenger in 2012 and Carter's Republican challenger in 1976 and 1980 haunted me too. Conservatives had questioned Ronald Reagan's ideological purity ever since his days as California governor, when he raised taxes, doubled spending, signed a bill liberalizing abortion reform into law, and participated in welfare reform. Reagan unsuccessfully sought the Republican nomination in 76, only to win it in 1980, despite the fact that the right mistrusted Reagan, among other things, for his choice of Richard Schweiker as running mate in 76, and Bush won in 1980. The new rights Richard Vigory worked for John Connolly in 1980, while Paul, Ray while Paul Weyrich predicted that a Reagan presidency would bring tired old Eastern establishment Republicans back to Washington. Now since then, of course, the right has transformed Reagan into an icon. And like Reagan, Mitt Romney was a moderate governor. Like Reagan in 1976 and 1980, Romney unsuccessfully sought the nomination in 2008, only to win it over the right's objections in 2012. I feared that as Reagan crushed Carter in 1980, so Romney would fell Obama in 2012. So, even though the Democrats weren't divided in 2012, as they had been in 1980 between Ted Kennedy and Carter, and even though Carter biographer and Reagan historian Julian Zelizer reminded CNN that Obama is not Carter, Romney is not Reagan, I worried. If the 2012 election showed us anything, it was that my fears were misplaced. Elizabeth Drew has ticked off the truisms that 2012 exposed as bromides. Few, few Democrats could be elected to a second term because only one had been since FDR. No Democrat was electable unless he hailed from the South. No incumbent could win re-election when unemployment was around 8%. And, as Drew says, to appreciate the enormous implications of the 2012 results, we need only think of what would have been said had Obama lost. Obama's 2008 election would have been dismissed as the anomaly that Romney and his pollsters beguiled themselves into thinking it was. The Citizens United decision would have been deemed an insurmountable advantage for Republicans instead of a blessing in disguise that ensured so many advertisements that it turned voters off. And Obama would have joined Jimmy Carter on the list of failed one-term wonders. But just as Romney wasn't Reagan, so Obama wasn't Carter. Not not that the results seemed as decisive for Obama as they were for Reagan in either 1980 or 1984. 
In 2008, I was in Paris two weeks after the election. Obama's photo was everywhere, and strangers approached me offering congratulations. I guess I look like a Democrat. In, in 2012, I was en route to Paris two weeks before the election. I was standing in line in Heathrow when I found an October 22 Washington Post story on my Kindle entitled, Dead Heat in U.S. Presidential Race Surprises Observers Abroad. It began, as President Obama and Mitt Romney prepare for a debate on foreign policy, and polls show the Republican challenger has a real chance of victory, many observers abroad are saying, wait, what? <laughs> According to the article, from the Scottish Highlands to the heels of Italy, it's Obama country all the way. And Europeans could not get their heads around the possibility of a tight election. At just the moment I began reading the article, the English woman ahead of me in line looks over and says, I cannot believe your election is even close. <laughs> Now, even though Nate Silver's 538 always gave the Democrats reason to hope, the election was close. Obama won 332 electoral votes to Romney's 206. 50.95% of the popular vote to Romney's 47.31%, a margin of 3.64%. Sounds good to this 21st century Democrat. And it's noteworthy that Obama won nine of his ten battleground states, as well as delicious that Romney ultimately received 47% of the vote. But Beth Gage observes that between 1900 and 1999, only five of the 25 presidential elections were decided by fewer than 130 electoral votes, and in only four of those elections, did the winner have a popular margin smaller than Obama's in 2012? Truman won more popular votes in his 1948 squeaker over Dewey than Obama did over Romney. As Gage says, it's a sign of how accustomed we've become to a raisin to razor-thin margins of victory in recent years, that Obama's popular vote victory seems almost like a rout. Historians love to point to Ecclesiastes and editorialize that there's nothing new under the sun. So, like Gage and David Kennedy, I emphasize that we have seen these kinds of election results before. Back in the Gilded Age, when the issues of industrialization, immigration, and cultural difference also roiled the United States, and gridlock ensued. Even though the president is more powerful now, it has sometimes seemed as if we're living in a new Gilded Age during the last four years, and that we have once again been, to borrow from Theodore Roosevelt, standing at Armageddon. From the Democrats' perspective, though fiscal cliffs still threaten, Armageddon has receded. But what awaits us? Does the future mean an end to American empire and a transformation of U.S. foreign policy? Who knows? I'm astonished that Guantanamo remains open, even though five former secretaries of state added their voices to the many advocating closure in 2008. Was voter turnout lower in 2012 than in 2008 and 2004 because of the success of voter suppression and or because of declining voter interest? Unclear. Has the religious right lost its power? I think it more probable that evangelicals aligned with the religious right mistrusted Mormons and that their support for Romney was soft. Will Republicans continue to treat the Democrats as members of, in Lou Gould's words, the party of treason? It looks like it. Does the 2012 election mean that the Republicans <coughs> lost because Romney wasn't conservative enough as the evangelicals on the right and conservative activists maintain? Or 
did the Republicans lose? Because they ran too far to the right. And because, to quote Dick Morris, this is not your father's United States, but one with a permanently high turnout of uh, blacks, Latinos, and young people. Again, who knows? Will the, vote, will the Republicans hire better pollsters next time? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Does the 2012 election mean a realignment? Your guess is as good as mine. Amid all this uncertainty, it's clear that for Democrats, Armageddon has been pushed back in large part because the Obama campaign took a leaf out of Bush 2's playbook, 2004 playbook and attacked Romney's record of Bain so successfully that conservatives charged Democrats with swift voting Romney. The Democratic campaign saddened me, just as I wanted Obama to govern in his first term as LBJ in 63 to 65, so I wanted him to run for his second as FDR in 36, not as Bush II in 2004. I wanted Obama to talk about the importance of the election for the Supreme Court, though FDR didn't mention the court, of course. <laughs> Willie Forbath has shown that the rhetoric of constitutional change suffused FDR's campaign. I wanted Obama to talk more about the poor, not the middle class. I wanted him to sound more anti plutocratic a la FDR. I should like to have it said of my first administration that in it the forces of selfishness and of lust for power met their match, and that in the second they met their master. Now, of course, the forces of organized money are not unanimous in their hatred of Obama. But they weren't unanimous in their hatred of FDR either. And even when it doesn't reflect reality, campaign rhetoric can inform us about candidate aspiration. But Obama has never made FDR his model. To the extent that Obama has sounded like any Roosevelt, it's the Republican Roosevelt of the 1903 Square Deal even though Obama went to Ozawatomie to celebrate the Theodore Roosevelt of the new nationalism. Another Obama model, according to the proverbial Washington insiders, is that Roosevelt of the right, Ronald Reagan in 1985 to 86. Now that the 2012 election has liberated Obama from the Carter curse, Will that election free Obama to lead as vigorously as Theodore Roosevelt after the 1904 election or Ronald Reagan 80 years later? Only time will tell. Thank you. Well, I think the outstanding fact about the 2012 presidential election, from a historical perspective, is that it really did ratify the historic results of 2008. That said, though, I want to bring up three myths. So I'm going to right away disagree with Laura and with Beth Gage. Myth number one is that it was a close election. I don't think it was that close an election if you look at the last 50 years of elections. 1960, 1968, 1976, 2000, 2004, all were closer. If you look over the last 50 years, this election was sort of in the middle. It's true that Obama, is, not since Andrew Jackson, has someone won re-election with a lower, you know, by a, a narrower margin, not since 1820, 1832. True. Nevertheless, as things have gone recently, this was sort of in the middle. And when you look at the real vote suppressor in New York and New Jersey, called Hurricane Sandy, that vote might have been in so I think, and, you know, when, when you have a million, 1.3 million more votes for Democratic House candidates, even though they didn't win the House, right, you pick up in the Senate, I think it was a good year for the Democrats. I, think, I don't think it was that close an election. Secondly, that Romney was just a bad candidate. He may have been a bad candidate, but that wasn't the only problem. If you look at the states, Romney actually ran ahead of the Republican candidates for the Senate in many, many states. 
Did somebody say Iran? <laughs> I thought they said go Romney. That's oh, go Romney. Right. <laughs> That's fine. I, I'm sort of doing that pitch. Um, in, in, you know, Texas, uh, Indiana, I mean, a lot of places he actually ran ahead. Now, that isn't dispositive, but it's an indication that perhaps Romney wasn't so bad. Maybe the Republican Party has a problem. Maybe the name Republican is a problem. And thirdly is the white vote. Because there isn't anything like, there isn't any such thing as the white vote. There is a southern and Appalachian white vote that went anywhere from 80 to 90 percent against Obama. There's a, a, the rest of the white vote nationwide is much closer. I'm not saying that race isn't a factor outside of the South and Appalachia. What I'm saying is that those numbers are very, very skewed, so you have to break it down. You should also break it down by age. Because younger white voters are much more voted much more for Obama than uh, than their elders did, so we have to be sophisticated about that. Okay, three myths. We can talk about that back and forth. Getting back to the history, I think that a conservative Republican coalition that's been unraveling for decades, beginning in 1992, really proved unable to unseat a highly vulnerable incumbent, the only incumbent since FDR to win re-election with the unemployment rate at 7.8 percent or higher. Although President Obama lost in Indiana and North Carolina, states he'd won before, he held Virginia and he held Florida by a little bit, but he held them, and crucially held the swing states of the lower Northeast and upper Midwest, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin. In critical demographics, notably Hispanic voters, younger voters, and women, Obama won by resounding margins that augured well for the Democrats in the future. During the campaign, I was giving some lectures trying to put the continuing contest in some historical perspective. And my point then was really pretty simple. That in order to win the Republican nomination, Governor Mitt Romney had had a tack so far to the right on hot button issues such as immigration and women's reproductive health that it was difficult to see how he could successfully tack back. His campaign advisor called it Etch-a-Sketch. <laughs> During the first presidential time, this is not polemical, this is just fact. <laughs> During the first presidential debate, it's true, Romney rhetorically shifted back to the center and really stunned Obama. But Obama, in the next debates, regained his stride. It did not take a genius, not even a genius on the order of Nate Silver, <laughs> to see how the trend was breaking. At least if turnout held up. I mean, not with polls in early October, for example. Early October, that showed that Romney was trailing Obama among Hispanic voters by a staggering gap of 70% to 26% with only 4% undecided. And that gap actually held up at 71 to 27, as far as we can tell from the uh, exit polls on election day. Even if Romney spent to the center at work, meanwhile, he would have been in a very difficult spot. For if he governed as a Republican, he may well have lost the country. And if he governed as an etch-a-sketch moderate, he would have lost his party as George H.W. Bush had learned in 1990. We are not a cheerleading squad, Representative Jeff Landry, a fire-eating freshman from this very state of Louisiana, had said as early as April when asked about Romney governing as a moderate. We are the conductor. We are supposed to drive the train. And Grover Norquist, the right-wing enforcer, was that polemical? Maybe. <laughs> announced that Romney would simply rubber stamp what was put on his desk. But as it happened, the die was cast well before Election Day, and things did not come to that. So, the conventional wisdom in the face of the results is that the GOP must learn to learn its lesson and move to the center if it's to be a viable contender in presidential politics. Even on the very conservative website Red State, the blogger Kaibo has insisted that, quote, the GOP must move its platform and outreach into the 21st century. But this will be far more difficult than the pundits imagine. It assumes, first, that a considerable portion of the Republican Party doesn't believe the hard right positions its candidates have taken on taxes, immigration, contraception, and all the rest. It assumes that there is command headquarters of Republican bosses who can move the party's ideological line like a spotlight. If such a place exists, I tell you, Speaker John Boehner would like to know where he is. <laughs> it also flies in the face of history especially the Republicans' history of the last quarter century. And that history has been one of a steady shift from the center-right to the right to the hard-right, with few stops in between. In 1988, George H.W. Bush, despite proclaiming that he would usher in a kinder, gentler era, ran a demagogic campaign on race and patriotism, 
Yet, when Bush governed as his own man in foreign affairs, a realist, and on fiscal matters, a traditional responsible Republican, he won the undying enmity of the House Republican Robespierre, Newt Gingrich. And a highly costly primary challenge in 1992 from Patrick J. Buchanan, whose previous job was as communications director of the Reagan White House. When Bill Clinton won the White House, the center of national Republican action shifted to the Congress. And when, after the defeat of President Clinton's health care plan in 1994, the Republicans seized the majority in the Senate and the House, the processes of repeated radicalization of the Republican conference, especially in the House, took hold. First, Clinton outfoxed now Speaker Gingrich amid two Republican instigated government shutdowns, attempting to force tax cuts and cuts in Medicare. Then, excuse me, he won re-election over the Republican Senate's establishment leader, Robert Dole. After losing, the Republicans moved farther to the right, and the House Republicans tried and failed to remove President Clinton through an unconstitutional impeachment trial. Except for the left-wing Ralph Nader and the one-vote conservative majority on the Supreme Court, a perverse alliance, George W. Bush would not have become president. And even then, he promised a compassionate conservatism that provoked his father's kinder, gentler rhetoric. But well before the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, Bush the Younger, a far more convincing Texas conservative than his father, made clear that his domestic policies would be geared chiefly to pleasing the more conservative elements of his political base, not least with respect, with respect to tax cutting and fiscal policy. And as long as he had the upper hand, before and after 9-11, Vice President Dick Cheney, a master of the executive branch and its bureaucratic workings, controlled the intelligence and flow of information to the president, who was as uninformed as he wanted to be about how things worked. <laughs> Yet the rightward march hardly reached its final destination under Bush the Younger. Having already upset some Republicans with his Medicare prescription drug reform, unfunded at his insistence, having plundered the surplus left by Clinton, and having failed soon after his, after his re-election to advance the privatization of Social Security, Bush angered much of the Republican base with his efforts to overhaul immigration policy. Above all, Bush's interventions to bail out the big banks during the catastrophic financial crisis of late 2008 largely the consequence of this willfully blind policy of non-regulation of the financial sector, deeply offended the right wing of his party, which saw it as a vast, wasteful, and even oppressive exercise of federal power. The history of the Tea Party begins here, with Bush. Thereafter, no credible hard-right candidate to succeed Bush the Younger, and with the Bush name now in disfavor, the Republicans ran two presidential candidates, John McCain and Mitt Romney, who were out of step with what their party had become ideologically and organizationally. Both felt compelled to solve the problem with their running mates, Sarah Palin and Paul Ryan. And whereas McCain was stuck with the tattered legacy of George W. Bush, Romney was stuck with the hard right positions on taxes, immigration, and the social issues that he had adopted in order to win the nomination, leaving the widespread impression that he didn't really believe in anything at all. Like a never-ending Jacobin upheaval, that's a historical reference. <laughs> the never-ending part. Yes. <laughs> the never-ending tour. Never mind. <laughs> All other thing. Like a never-ending Jackman of people, the Republican Party has been consumed by its own right wing, now orchestrated by billionaires like the Koch brothers, organizations like Club for Growth and Freedom Works, and the media overlords of Fox News and right wing talk radio. Even the Heritage Foundation, a think tank, has taken on as its new director the Tea Party Politico, former Senator Jim DeMint of South Carolina, who no one has ever accused of being a policy expert. There is today no sign whatsoever of a credible re Republican candidate who can pass muster with the party's new powers of be unless he or she were to come to scrap, scrap the positions that lend credibility, another exercise in Etch-a-Sketch. Except for gerrymandering after 2010, the party would have control over no portion of the elected federal government. Democratic candidates outpolled Republicans for the House by 1.3 million votes in 2012, and that gerrymandering, I submit, entrenches the party's right wing. Nationally, the party has begun to resemble nothing so much as the Democratic Party of the 1880s and 1890s, a regional party centered in the Deep South, where, as I said, in some states, 90%, I think Mississippi was one, 90% of the all white voters back Romney, as well as the more sparsely populated of the Plains and Mountain states. This state of affairs gives the Democrats great possibilities if they, and in particular the president, can lead the way through the austerity trap 
that the administration helped to contrive, actually, in response to the hostage-taking of the Republicans over the debt limit fiasco of 2011, and which led the nation to the so-called fiscal cliff. The combination of radicalization and political marginalization, which over the long term have gone hand in hand, has created a Republican faction in the Congress that has shown it will stop at nothing to pursue its agenda. Speaker Boehner's efforts to discipline that faction have only been followed by even more pathetic displays of his impotence. And it is this faction, these Republicans whom, among others, Norman Ornstein and Thomas Mann, political scientists and centrists both, certainly at the center of the Washington establishment, have blamed for the current political stalemate in Congress. The 2012 election did not resolve the crisis, but it did clarify the politics of the future. The Republican Party is an increasingly minority party that will use every lever to maintain its power. And the Democratic Party is an emerging majority party that is yet to secure, a sec yet to gain a secure hold. The 2012 election is not the end of that conflict. The greatest collisions undoubtedly lie ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim and uh, Bill, for convening this panel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with my very distinguished colleagues. Uh, I'm going to focus my remarks and election reflections on two particular areas of interest to me, uh, somewhat disparate ones, foreign policy and religion. Uh, but in both of these areas, my organizing theme for thinking about the 2012 election is back to the 1950s. Uh, by which I mean bipartisan continuity in foreign policy and inclusive pluralism in, in religion. And here's what I mean. The uh, 2012 presidential election mirrored the bipartisan continuity in foreign policy represented by the Eisenhower administration in the 1950s, uh, particularly as it uh, followed the Truman administration. It also reflected the vision of an inclusive, doctrinally minimalist civil religion pioneered by Eisenhower. First on uh, foreign policy, on national security policy. I think the 2012 election further reinforced a tradition of bipartisan continuity in American national, national security policy when you, look, when you look at the actual substance of policies rather than just the, uh, the, electoral, uh, uh, the electoral heat and contention during, during campaigns. Uh, it represented the convocation and the public ratification by the electorate of the counterterrorism framework developed under, the, under, under President Bush when the Bush 43 and continued under Obama. Main feature of this include uh, a war framework for the conflict with uh, jihadist terrorism as opposed to a, a legal framework uh, that had uh, governed it before 9-11. Uh, I know Laura's done a lot of work on this. Uh, the vigorous assertion of executive authority for wartime powers and the use of force. Uh, here, President Obama has even exceeded uh, Bush and Cheney and the uh, unitary executive, executive theory there. Uh, the continuation of once controversial, now ho-hum things like the Patriot Act and certain forms of warrantless wiretaps, um, once vilified and now hardly even noticed. Guantanamo is still open, uh, and no one seems to be paying a lot of attention, a lot of attention to that. Extraordinary renditions are still uh, a central part of American counterterrorism policy. And the preemptive and unilateral use of force, uh, particularly in the conduct of, uh, of drone strikes against uh, terrorists or terrorist suspects in a, in a range of countries, not uh, much, much beyond Afghanistan. And here I think uh, President Obama's expansion of the, uh, the drone strike campaign uh, into now its own almost little mini war with almost no domestic opposition embodies a sort of mixed into China political dynamic. If only he could get away with this. Um, I'm, I'm a Republican. My Republican friends and I have a little game we, uh, sardonic game we play over email sometimes. What if Bush had done this? And we do that a lot with, <laughs> what if Bush had gone around uh, unilaterally assassinating American citizens in places like Yemen uh, without, without, without due process, without a declaration of war? And, and by the way, I'm mostly trying to offer some historical uh, reflections here and not get into the normative issues. I actually support, as a Republican, I support President Obama on these, on these policies, but I, I do think it's just very interesting looking at how the, uh, the dissonance from what were once campaign issues and now become policies that play plays out. So, um, and, and here it's notable how, in contrast to the fiercely contentious debates over national security, especially in the 2004 election, also somewhat in 2008, uh, this was virtually a non-issue in, in the 2012 election. 
Rather, I think the 2012 election represented a bipartisan codification of this framework in two ways. First, by returning President Obama to a second term, the American people show they support this framework. They're, by and large, uh, on board with the war on terror, or whatever we want to call it these days. Um, second, the fact that Governor Romney differed little from President Obama on most major foreign policy issues, and not at all on counterterrorism, reified, I think, the enduring Republican support for this strategic paradigm. That also, between the electorate ratified and the, the opposition party not opposing it, um, that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that codified it. But historically, this is part of a long tradition of partisan disputes evolving into bipartisan agreements on foreign policy. Again, with my Back to the 50s theme, it's similar to uh, the Truman and Eisenhower uh, dynamic, where Eisenhower you know, campaigns against Truman's foreign policy in, in 1952, uh, calls for rollback instead of containment, um, but only uh, once in office largely adopts uh, the, the containment paradigm, um, which again was reaffirmed with Eisenhower's re-election in 1956. There's other parallels here as well. Remember in 1992 when Governor Clinton campaigned against uh, George H.W. Bush's appeasement of the butchers of Beijing, promised to uh, link MFN renewal to, to human rights improvements, uh, but then once in office uh, pivots and it, it basically embraces uh, the Bush 41 administration's uh, strategic approach to China of eventually dual, dual track of balancing with, with engagement. Uh, and again, uh, George W. Bush campaigned uh, against Clinton's China policy in 2000 and then more or less adopted it once in office. Uh, President Obama has, has continued that one. So China policy is another example of these bipartisan uh, continuities. So historically, I think a strategic doctrine uh, seems to become embedded in American foreign policy when it's adopted by the successor administration of an, of, of an opposite party. This, this now very much appears to be the case with American counterterrorism policy. Um, but still, compared to the campaign promises and the public expectations in 2008, uh, particularly on the Democrat side, that were so critical of so many aspects of the Bush-Cheney counterterrorism policy, this change of direction once in office by the Obama administration uh, on national security is remarkable. And I think for future historical work, if there's any uh, grad students in the room or uh, those of us who may be mentoring grad students, once the uh, archives are open, I think exploring how and why this change occurred will be a, a fascinating question. Turning now to, to religion, um, uh, as others have, have pointed out, I, I still think is uh, very notable. This was, uh, as far as we can tell, the first time in U.S. history that neither of the major party tickets had a WASP candidate uh, for president or vice president. Um, three of the four leaders of the respective sl uh, slates were non-Protestants, the Catholics Biden and, and uh, Paul Ryan, and of course the Mormon Romney. The sole Protestant was, was President Obama. I think what's most remarkable about this is how unremarkable it actually was. It really was, was very little, little of an issue. I think it may represent the final step in the dissolution of the once dominant Protestant establishment that dominated American public life for a couple of centuries. Uh, but it also represents the political fruition of Eisenhower's effort to create an inclusive, doctrinally minimalist civil religion. So while Eisenhower embodied much of the Protestant establishment himself, his rhetorical and institutional efforts to create a broader civil religion uh, that embraced Catholics and Jews and Mormons, and even to some sense Muslims, and this is a uh, uh, little appreciated by Eisenhower's record going back to the, in, uh, the 50s. This included appointing Ezra Taft Benson as Secretary of Agriculture, the first Mormon cabinet secretary, um, and arguably that laid the groundwork for, uh, for, uh, for Romney to later run. Now, uh, Laura, this is where I'm going to pick up on some of your comments, although differ a little bit on the question of uh, evangelical support for, for, uh, for Romney. I think the 2012 election also reinforced the continuing trend of American Protestants, especially evangelicals, to embrace members of other faiths that were previously considered theological adversaries. As recently as 1960, Billy Graham and other leading evangelicals had opposed uh, JFK's candidacy only because he was Catholic. Graham's father-in-law and fellow evangelical leader, L. Nelson Bell, who was the editor of Christianity Today magazine at the time, wrote to Nixon just days after his election loss uh, to, to Kennedy. And in Bell's words, he worried that Kennedy's victory represented a slow, completely integrated, and planned attempt to take over our nation for the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, it may sound hysterical to our ears at the time, uh, our ears now, but at the time that was uh, sort of the, the common thought among a lot of uh, conserv conservative Protestants. 
Yet, uh, you know, barely 50 years later, the 2012 Republican primary saw conservative evangelicals initially unite behind the, the Roman Catholic Rick Santorum as their preferred standard bearer. They didn't care that he was Catholic, they just liked that he was conservative on social issues. And after he dropped out, they backed Romney. Um, the reason for this is, I think, shared moral and political commitments, even if theological commitments differ, or differ, differ radically. The roots of this change are in the 1970s and 1980s with the rise of the, uh, the moral majority and the religious right, where evangelicals and Catholics experienced a political rapprochement around shared social conservatism, particularly opposition to abortion, just 15 years really after the Kennedy election. Uh, I think the past decade has seen a similar dynamic between evangelicals and Mormons. Uh, not unity around theological issues, they both agree that they disagree very much on those, but much more unity around politics, especially social conservatism. In the 2012 election, 78% of white evangelicals voted for Romney, up from the 74% who voted for McCain in 2008. Uh, now the question would be, and we need to drill down more, did a number of them just stay home because they found Obama uh, un un unpalatable? So I don't, I don't want to overstate this here, but again, the big story uh, leading up to the election is going to be, you know, evangelicals will veto Romney, they'll never get behind Romney. Uh, a, lot of them, a lot of them did, and, and, made, and uh, certainly made, made peace with this. Um, so I think the previous predictions that evangelicals uh, would not vote for a Mormon candidate were proven, proven largely wrong. Romney himself had addressed this in his commencement address at uh, uh, Jerry Falwell's Liberty University back in, uh, in, in May of 2012. And he said, look, we have a different faith, but we share common values. Um, and his uh, words that could have come out of Eisenhower's mouth. Um, I think this, this evangelical support for a Mormon candidate represents a continuation of a trend of American evangelicalism being defined more as a sociological and political movement rather than a, a set of shared theological commitments. There does remain one noticeable pocket of anti-Mormon electoral sentiments, and that's the 24% of Democrats and the 18% of independents who say they would never vote for a Mormon, uh, as opposed to 10% uh, of Republicans. Uh, many of these Democrats might be unaware that the Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid is a Mormon. Um, these anti-Mormon sentiments did not cost Romney the election, since these voters, uh, since most uh, most anti-Mormon sentiment is going to be among uh, among Democrats, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't vote for Romney even if he was a, a Presbyterian. Um, nonetheless, I do think this represents at least a uh, some regnant pocket of religious prejudice in American life. Um, notably, the overall figure of 18% of Americans who say they would never vote for a Mormon for president is virtually unchanged from 1967, when Romney's father, George Romney, uh, Governor George Romney, was first running for president. At the time, 17% of Americans said they would never vote for a Mormon. Uh, now, by way of comparison, uh, th these figures come from a, a Gallup poll last year. Uh, just 4% of Americans say they would never vote for a black candidate. Um, 40% would not vote for a Muslim candidate, and 43% would not vote for an atheist. Uh, now, you know, as with all of us here, we have to take these uh, figures with some degree of skepticism. But I think even how people respond to the opinion polls tells us something about their perception of the social acceptance or not of prejudice. So is it okay to come out and say, I never would, never would do that in case of Mormons, atheists, and Muslims? Uh, good number of Americans think, uh, think so. But still, the fact that both major party candidates, uh, both major party tickets were headed by non-WASPs, and three of the four were Catholic or Mormon, shows the expansion and perhaps even the fulfillment of Eisenhower's religious vision in American public life, of Americans from all faiths being welcome to participate as long as they believe in God and in the American political system. This also, in a way, demonstrates the continuing salience of Will Herberg's original 1955 thesis, The Protestant Catholic Jew. American public re religiosity is defined not by creedal particulars, but by a general fidelity to the American way of life. I guess this, there's no one else left, I guess, in the next. <clears throat> Let me just say first, as someone who has worked for or against or with every American president since, uh, uh, including Nixon to Obama. I'm very fond of Jimmy Carter, and Rosalind too, and I love Jimmy Carter. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I never say there's no candidate who can come along that the other party will get, and uh, the Republicans can't find anybody or whatever. We all said that about the Democrats when Reagan won two terms and Bush one, and then along came Bill Clinton. So 
I never say that somebody's going to come along and somebody is going to catch the fancy of everyone. The third point is that I lost interest in the 2012 election last summer when I, my friends can tell that this is true, when I wrote a piece for Politico in which I uh, joined Bill Clinton in accusing the, the Democrats of swift boating um, Romney, which in fact they did do over the Bay and Capitol issue, but what I said was that it was very effective swift boating uh, and that it would work and that that along with raising some other campaign issues had effectively put the election beyond Romney's reach uh, and that it was over. So I spent the rest of the time uh, just reassuring everybody and then on the street <laughs> about the election. So the only thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to try to remain a historian here, and first I, is voter su suppression as an issue. The first thing I'm going to do is tell you a story, and you may think the story has nothing to do with what I'm supposed to be talking about, but it does, so <laughs> please bear with me. In the year 2000, Eddie Gregg, the white owner-operator of a furniture and machinery repair shop, grew tired of his brother Errol complaining to him about corrupt politics in the city of St. Martinsville, uh, Louisiana, where he lived. His brother, who lived in Broussard, the next town over, kept nagging Eddie about how his town had held no council election at all in recent memory. One seat in a predominantly black ward was controlled by a white family fiefdom, the Thibodeaux. The incumbent was Pam Thibodeau, appointed after her father died. If an election had been held, black voters would have given the city council a black majority for the first time, so they just didn't have an election. Fed up with his brother shaming him in public places like bars, Eddie hired a lawyer from another parish to sue St. Martinville officials. <laughs> Local members of the NACP eagerly added black plaintiffs, and the suit alleging discrimination under the Voting Rights Act and the uh, 14th, 15th Amendments went to federal court. Embarrassed over the resulting news stories, the Justice Department in Washington filed its own case in the same court where Eddie Gregg had filed. Gregg withdrew his suit once Bill Lon Lee, President Clinton's Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, arrived in town to personally work the case. By this time, there had been no council election in over 12 years. President George Herbert Walter Bush's nominee, Judge Rebecca Doherty, ordered an election for District 3, Pam Thibodeau's seat. Mary Francois, a black businesswoman, ran against her. The Thibodeaux immediately went into action. Sue Thibodeau, the local registrar of voters, was related to Pam Thibodeau. <laughs> Pam Thibodeau's husband worked for the city's mayor, Eric Martin, who was the son of Nicky Martin, the former police chief who was related to Pam Thibodeau's father. <laughs> the close election led to a runoff which Pam Thibodeau won by 13 votes. Francois sued for irregularities, and the local judge threw out every vote in Thibodeau's victory margin as illegal, except one, <laughs> making sure she still won. <laughs> illegal voters listed the house of former police chief Dickey pardoned as their voting address. Some were city employees. Several others were relatives of the Thibodeaux, and all had legal residencies elsewhere and not in St. Martinville. Chief Martin explained, so what? If you went through every house in this region, you're going to find people who don't live there but are registered there. <laughs> Though she appealed, Mary Francois lost her case before it ever reached a higher court. On the last day to post the required appeal bond, she finally had enough contributions to post it. But word passed to the Thibodeaux and Martins that she was on her way to the courthouse. When she arrived, she found that the clerk had just closed early for the day. <laughs> But this was not the end of the story, because accumulating political scandals, which are always occurring in Louisiana, <laughs> helped Susan Hake Terrell, a Republican, gain election as Commissioner of Elections in 1999 on a platform as fighting against voting abuses. Terrell intended to keep her campaign promises and then run for higher office. She appointed an African American, Orleans Parish Deputy Sheriff Greg Malvo, to run a new fraud division. Malvo had been detailed as her executive protection when she was on the New Orleans City Council, so she knew him.
After Terrell made a round of public speeches announcing this new office, their hotline received a pile of mostly anonymous complaints from all over the state. They investigated hundreds of cases in 2001 involving vote buying and hauling, double voting, precinct workers getting paid when they didn't work, and polling places being moved without informing voters. As they gained experience, one elderly resident in Iberia Parish willingly described to Mark Malvo how this worked. She said, poor people expect to receive small amounts of money to vote illegally or not to vote, depending on what the vote buyers and vote haulers need. <laughs> the corruption was engaged in by Democrats and Republicans. In rural areas, vote buyers acting as middlemen generally received $10 from a candidate who made no contact with any voter during the process and then gave $5 to the voter. Voters would also be given a pork chop sandwich and a cold drink. <laughs> In urban areas, the process of chaos were handled by organizations with names like the Alliance for Good Government. <laughs> and the politicians paid them for endorsements, which they passed along some of the money. The fraud division arrested some middlemen, but local elected prosecutors who were connected to important politicians who funded all the corruption didn't prosecute anybody. After Malvo went to a local reporter who began writing critical stories, a few cases were tried, and a few local judges convicted somebody, but then they announced suspended sentences. As for Thibodeau, Malvo used the publicity around the Bush v. Gore disputed election in 2000 to embarrass the U.S. attorney, now a George W. Bush appointee at that time, into prosecuting. He told him he would generate all kinds of press criticism if he refused to act. Thereafter, Pam Thibodeau was convicted in federal court and resigned. Her punishment was a period of community service. The local DA then announced to the press that he would prosecute the remaining culprits in local court. But the judge, listening to the evidence, convicted them, but he complained that he didn't like having to do this and gave the defendants the usual slap on the wrist, community service. Instead of appointing Mary Francois, who had actually won the election and had gone through all this, to the interim vacancy before the election, the mayor and the white council members appointed an African-American, Dennis Williams, who they described as a painter and musician in his brother's band, Nathan and the Zydeco cha -Chas. The mayor said, you know, it's typical to see good old Dennis out there on the sidewalk with his room waving at cars as they go by. <laughs> Besides, about the only thing you can say about him is he goes to church a lot, and he's just a good fellow. He believes in healing rather than fighting. Okay. Now, there are many places where routine, I told you the story for a reason, routine, actual voter suppression and fraud take place, like the one I just described, without redress, other than in when we talk about president elections presidential elections. We talk about it during presidential elections. We talk about it. Uh, in recent history, if you remember the 2000 Bush v. Gore, Gore contest, there were, to be sure, actual voter manipulation and suppression, which made a difference. 2012 was a bad year for Florida's electoral procedures, too. However, there was nothing like the thousands of registered voters who were actually not permitted to vote at all in Florida in 2000. I'm not talking about chads, I'm talking about people not being permitted to vote. During the 2012 election, when disappointment with President Obama and related economic anxieties led to polls <laughs> showing the likelihood of a depressed youth and African American vote, highlighting voter suppression was a very effective voter turnout strategy. It helped to make the election not about the economy stupid, along with the war on women and other issues, that's what the campaign ended up being about. For African Americans, the memory of Knight Riders and the Klan and the White Citizens Council and the fire bombings of activists who were trying to mobilize voters is palpable. It's bred in the bone. In the 2012 campaign, analogies to poll taxes and the violence in the 60s and John Lewis and Bloody Selma stirred and evoked those memories. Override, overriding every possible discontent with President Obama. Going to the polls and voting in the black community and it became a show of defiance, a crusade. People weren't even thinking about going to vote and who were upset. 
decided they had to go. Republicans foolishly relying on polls, which said that voters generally supported voter ID laws, created an opening for Democrats to use voter suppression as a turnout strategy. The Democrats' full court press on the issue was at least as brilliant as the Republican Party emphasizing to urban working men in the 1890s that they would lose their jobs if Republicans lost, which helped McKinley to win the 1896 election. Unsurprisingly, after trumpeting the issue of voter suppression during the campaign, Democrats and their activists and human rights supporters feel the need to suggest remedies for what they talked about. So just before the Christmas break, at a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, the witnesses listed all of the possible problems that could have happened in 2012, which were the actual problems that did happen in Florida in 2000. They then asked for federal standards in presidential elections, just as the witnesses did in the hearings I held at the Civil Rights Commission, and in Chris Dodd's the Senate hearings after the 2000 election. Of course, unless the Constitution is changed, there won't be any federal standards for presidential elections. There's a little thing called Article I, and the states decide how to select electors. They would be better off working in campaigns in local elections, as my editor just pointed out to me this morning, my book editor, one of my book editors, uh, to try to elect some people to change the state laws. But anyway, that's another story. But the answer we got in Bush v. Gore was that states control this, and they do. And at that point, in those hearings, the last time, Congress was reduced to passing something called the Help America Vote Act to give large amounts of money to the states in the hopes that they would improve and clean up the process. Congress could now, after all is said and done, decide to give the states even more money. Okay? Congress also established an election assistance commission, but it has had no members for quite some time, <laughs> which is telling in itself. In the meantime, actual abuses that affect poor and minority voters, which the federal government could do something about, remain unattended. <clears throat> What the Justice Department was shamed into doing in the Thibodeau prosecution, a local election, requires no more legislation, just committed lawyering when discrimination is perpetuated. The Justice Department did that in attacking voter ID laws as a part of reinforcing the campaign's voter suppression issue in the most recent election. As a final note, the fraud division in Louisiana has been basically inactive since another election brought in new political appointments. <laughs> I didn't say fraud was inactive, I said the fraud division. <laughs> also, the reporter, unfortunately, the reporter who insisted on reporting on the St. Martinville and other parish fraud investigations got fired for his trouble. Thank you very much. We've had four, I think, four presentations that can come at this from very different angles, uh, from the issue of, of voting and voter suppression to religion, foreign policy, uh, to comparisons with previous elections. Um, we've, I think we've learned that Eisenhower could not get elected uh, in 2012. Uh, I think the best thing would be we only have 25 minutes, so I think we're going to go directly to opening this to questions, comments from from the audience. And please come up to the microphone because uh, you should know, by the way, if you're going to make ask a question or make a comment, that this is being uh, recorded, being video recorded, so you are uh, also volunteering to be recorded, just so that you know. More exposure than I was counting on. Uh, so maybe I'll prove the uh, University of California at Santa Barbara. A question for uh, Professor Inboden. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about uh, anti Muslim sentiment uh, among the uh, American electorate, and especially within the Republican Party, because it seems to pose a pretty uh, strong challenge to this vision that you have laid out of sort of humanism in electoral politics. Uh, you did mention that there is. Uh, sentiment against atheists and Mormons um, who go to polls, but isn't it a bit misleading to put them in the same category? Because as far as I know, in the case of 
more, uh, Mormons and atheists, you don't have the same kind of campaigns against them as you do with this, most of these, these anti-Sharia ordinances across the country, uh, the reaction to the so-called um, Manhattan, uh, the Ground Zero mosques and so forth. So I'm wondering if you could just talk about that and how you fit that into your model of a increasing um, uh, ecumenism and the, uh, less and less attention being paid to the tribal aspects. Well, th this is a. Uh, did anyone hear the question, by the way? Okay, yeah. Yeah, about the anti Muslim sentiment. Um, uh, again, lest my remarks be misunderstood, I don't want to be sounded as painting this sort of linear progression into this golden era of complete religious pluralism and tolerance. Uh, uh, these are very contested zones. Uh, it uh, move, moves in, in m multiple directions. Uh, so on the, on the anti-Muslim sentiment, I think the figures I cited were 18% uh, of all Americans across parties say they would never vote for a Mormon candidate. 40% uh, of Americans across all parties say they would not vote for a Muslim candidate, and 43% say they would not vote for a for an atheist candidate. Just just for the for the, the context there. Um, but regarding um, uh, regarding the place of Muslims in American public life, uh, on the one hand, Muslims are uh, I suppose probably have numerically about the same number of Muslims in America as we do Mormons. I think it'd be roughly. Uh, roughly one and a half to two percent of the population. I know that getting those those figures can be um, uh, can be difficult. And Mormons, in that sense, are disproportionately represented in Congress. We've had we've had what one Muslim member of Congress, Keith Ellison from uh, from uh, Minnesota, and uh, a number number of Mormon Mormon members. Uh, I think you probably see stronger pockets of anti-Muslim sentiment uh, among the Republican electorate than you do the the Democrat electorate. Uh, but but the, when you break down the numbers, there's large numbers of Democrats who say they wouldn't vote for, for a Muslim either. Um, but at the same time, you can, uh, and this, this is where I think we need to problematize a lot of our usual categories. I can point to a number of grassroots campaigns against things like gay marriage, where you have Christian, Jewish, and Muslim clergy coming together. Uh, this happened in Maryland, this has happened uh, uh, in, uh, in New Jersey and Washington State and a number, a number of uh, uh, other states. At the same time, uh, of course, still partly uh, a unfortunate hangover from the September 11th attacks and ongoing war on terror, you have uh, among large swaths of American electorate uh, real you know, hostility and suspicion, uh, sometimes undiscriminating, uh, of, of, of Muslims. Uh, this was certainly, I think, where there's a lot of continuity between President Bush and Obama. They both tried to make very clear this is not a conflict with Islam, it's a conflict within Islam. And Muslims are going to be key to winning this fight against uh, the, the marginal uh, jihadist and ter 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 terrorist voices. Um, over time, hopefully, the war on terror, the conflict, whatever you want to call it, will will abate. Uh, and that's where it will. Uh, what seems to have been the general dynamic with past efforts at religious inclusion and, and pluralism is most of the, the differing faiths don't. Uh, moderate their theological convictions a lot. They still agree to disagree over the nature of what is Holy Scripture, who is a prophet, who is divine, etc. But they come together around shared political convictions. And that's what Eisenhower was doing in the 1950s. He said, I, you know, I don't care what your faith is as long as you believe in God and you don't believe in communism. And that's why he would host Muslim leaders at the White House and support the distribution of Qurans in Muslim countries to sort of bolster spiritual fervor against, against, uh, against communism. Um, insofar as Islamic communities do share some of the social conservative uh, convictions that other conservative religious groups, such as evangelical Protestants, Catholics, and Mormons have, you might see some interesting co-belligerency there, even while that will occur alongside or in tension with maybe some hostility or suspicion over terrorism and foreign policy issues, whether it's support for Israel, the war, uh, the war on terror, those kind of things. So, um, it's certainly, uh, I think, a very, very difficult issue to, to categorize. Uh, personally, I would love to see those numbers go way down in America and say they would never vote for a Muslim or atheist or those sort of things. I mean, the Constitution is pretty clear that there's no religious test for office. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name's uh, Rod Walton. I'm an adjunct at uh, Ford International University, and my uh, question is for my fellow Republican professor Imbiden, since you brought up uh, 
foreign policy, my question is, did the end of the Cold War have any impact on the long-term uh, American politics? Because I notice in the uh, 24 years from uh, 1968 to 1992, there were only four years in which there was a, a Democratic president in the 24 years uh, since uh, 1992, say the Cold War ended in 1991, there have been only eight years that a president has won the presidential election, only four years if you hold with Professor Lance and you ignore the actual recount that the uh, newspapers did, the fact that Bush did uh, win. But I just wonder if the, the reaction against the liberal wing of, in, in the their, for their actions against the Vietnam War made it easy to tar the Democrats as unpatriotic in the last quarter century of the, the Cold War and, and basically since then it's been fairly safe uh, to be a liberal in America, liberal Democrat in America. I noticed that uh, Teddy Kennedy was soundly defeated by Carter in 1980 whereas uh, Obama more or less had the same Senate voting record as uh, uh, Kennedy. Thank you for that question, which I uh, boiled down, I think, I, I take to be, uh, now that the Cold War is over, did Republicans lose their electoral advantage on national security issues? Uh, my short answer would be yes. My slightly longer answer would be, well, it's, it's complicated. Uh, <laughs> since I'm going to get a historian now, uh, and not, not just a bunch of people I can. And by the way, after this, I'll uh, Welcome to questions from my fellow panelists. <laughs> Being the Republican voice here, I. I <laughs> um, so with uh, with with Clinton, you know, he wins because he runs as a as, as a centrist and because uh, the economy was a big issue and foreign foreign policy just wasn't. Although uh, I think you see a lot more continuity and change with Clinton's foreign policy from Bush 41 and into into Bush Bush 43. Um, now to be a little confessional here, because I did work at the uh, national. Security Council for a couple of years under under Bush 43. So uh, this comment might surprise you. I see my former graduate school advisor John Butler here in the room. John, I don't know if you remember this comment you made to me once, but it's always uh, struck with me painfully. The Iraq War, among other tragedies, uh, politically it ruined the re Republican reputation for competence, uh, and I think that was uh, that was sadly true. Uh, so it's not just enough to be strong and forceful in foreign policy, you have to be competent as well. And I think that's where, um, uh, again, I you know, still have great affection uh, for, for President Bush and have many good things to say about him, but as he himself would tell you that he horribly, uh, horribly botched, botched that, that whole enterprise. And so that, I think, is another thing that's accounted for the Republicans losing some of their strength, electoral strength in foreign policy. But the third thing that happens is when Democrats start acting like Republicans. And that's what President Obama is doing, particularly when it comes to prosecuting the war on terror. So. Does anybody else want to speak? Anybody else want to speak to that one? Yeah, I do. I just, I just think that, I think that's right. And I think that the issue of war and peace has become somewhat neutralized in the country. Uh, we know that people don't even pay attention to foreign policy as an issue uh, in the campaigns. This last election was a values election. Um, that's what it was. War on women, um, what was the other thing? Border suppression, <laughs> all these things. Not anything about the economy and not anything about foreign policy, really. I mean, when you think about it, somebody would mention Syria every now and then, but nobody really talked about it. And the public really isn't that interested in it. And I don't know if it's because the Cold War is over or what the story is, but it was a values election. That basically, it's what it is. And as long as they continue to be values elections and you continue to have the values expressed by the American people be in a certain direction and the Republicans don't change, they're likely to lose. But my view would be that they'll change. They'll modify. That's what parties do. That's what the history of the whole process is. That's what the Democrats did. Uh, and so somewhere out of the West or someplace, the South or somewhere, there's going to come a Republican who's going to do what Clinton did with the Democrats. And then you're going to end up, Sean, seeing uh, the Republicans win again. <laughs> I'm not from Missouri. <laughs> No, you're definitely not. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Bill Clinton was actually out there in EBA. You, know, you could see him out there. He didn't want to run. I just don't see him. I'd like to, 
I'd like to be the same kind of politics that would be interested in contesting because I think we need a good opposition. But I just, I, 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 I think it's a faith-based initiative. Right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'll be <honest. laughs> If you go back to the 1970s, though, you know, the remarks that were made about the Republican Party after the congressional elections of 74, 75, 76, 7% 7 of Americans classified themselves as Republicans. They just don't go away. I, I, I understand, but I do think that the Republican Party has taken a different, and I'll, I'm sure my colleagues will disagree, but, but has taken a, it's, at least in Washington, has taken a very, very different turn than the Republicans in the 1970s. Well, I think that's right, but, you know, talking about them being dispatched sort of reminds me of Fukuyama and the end of history. <laughs> in the end, because history never ends, as we know. Uh, and therefore, somewhere, sometime, in other words, we're not going to perpetually be a part of a state country run by the Democratic Party. It just doesn't happen. There's somebody somewhere that we're not even thinking about uh, who's going to come and be uh, the standard bearer. I, I, I quite agree with that. Politics is not the, it's not, I'm not talking about the end of politics, nor am I talking about the end of the Republican Party. Uh, but I'm saying is that it's going to be much more difficult for the Republican Party to write itself than I think many of the pundits say. That it's simply a matter of, well, if someone will come along and do it, I think it's going to take a lot more um, than it did to take, turn the Democrats around, for example, in the 1980s. Well, yeah, I'll, and then we'll, one of the things I think that the debate here, in some ways, is part, it, it is, is a lot of what we as historians often do in other areas, which is a debate between thinking about a great man, a great person, which is when, when Sean says someone's going to come and turn it around, and social movements. Uh, does, this does this kind of change that we're talking about come from the bottom? Or does this kind of change come because somebody is out there uh, who's going to make this happen? And, and I think your assumption, Sean, is that it's going to take a somebody rather than a change in the Republican Party that's coming actually from Republicans. Well, I don't, I don't know that it's... Okay. Yeah, Mary. Well, I, I think that, look, in, in presidential politics, you need a candidate. <laughs> you, you can't just have a social movement run for president. Um, so, so that person has to come along. And I think, well, yeah, but president. I don't think yeah, yeah. All right. yeah. So, so it's going to take somebody, right? But somebody just doesn't happen out of, out of nowhere. Somebody has to, you know, appeal to a need, has to appeal to an issue, has to appeal to a lot of things, which is what you know Bill Clinton did, what Ronald Reagan did. Actually, the Republican Party, he repaired the Republican Party, turned it around, turned it. Fundamentally. So yeah, I mean, you know, politics matters, politicians matter, political leadership matters. Um, but it, it doesn't occur in a vacuum. Mary? So I, I just want to say, not about that. I mean, that's, that's fine. I'll agree with you, Sean, for purposes of the debate. One of the most amazing things to me about the 2012 and 2008 elections and about the history of uh, presidency and politics in this country is how the election of Obama did not vastly increase diversity in the institutions of our society. And that the numbers on diversity show that in some cases we've gone backwards since he's been president of the United States. The most amazing thing to me, when he was first elected, I sort of assumed that Obama would symbolize for everybody in every institution in society, including the AHA, <laughs> that you're supposed to have diversity and universities and everywhere and we would have this great outpouring of people of doing things on campuses and in every institution in society that would promote diversity and the fact of the matter is that it didn't happen that people give lip service to it and they're great that many people see Obama's election as a ratification of the fact that we've already done everything we need to do and people say that to me. They come up to me after I speak to audiences and say, well, isn't it great? We've done everything we need to do now. And so I think, I, Jim knows this, I just recently noted that in the AHA that we have been backsliding a little bit on diversity. It shocked me. Um, but it's, I'm not picking on the AHA. I'm just saying that in the institutions of society generally, and I don't know if any of you feel that where you are, and I don't just mean in your university, but any institution, <laughs> I don't see any great change that has occurred in that direction as a result of it being elected. And I don't know what that means, because as a matter of history, I would assume that when the time came, 
that you elected an African American president, that that would symbolize change everywhere. So in, in 2008, MSNBC gave about half a dozen historians an opportunity to talk about the historical significance of that election. And actually, what I said in that, in my 400 words, was I didn't think that would happen. I was, I was much less optimistic about that. I, I really didn't think that it was going to have that kind of dramatic change. Will you want to? Yeah, uh, just a, a couple points. Uh, one on this question about the Republican or the, uh, the so-called Republican swing to the to the far right. Um, I think that's a fairly ahistorical criticism, I and mean, this has always been there. In the 50s, in the 40s and 50s, you have the Taft versus the Eisenhower wings. In the 60s, the Goldwater versus the um, the Rockefeller wings. In the 70s, uh, wings. The, in the 70s, Reagan against, against Ford. Uh, I mean, the fact is, if you look at the you know the uh, last a couple decades of Republican nominees for president, they've generally been more from the from the centrist wing. H.W. Bush in 88 and 92, Dole in 96. Big government, compassionate conservative, reform immigration, George W. Bush in 2000-2004. McCain in 2008, Romney this, this last time. This is not to say that there's not this you know, fairly far, far right wing in the Republican Party as well, but it's not been, uh, it, it's not, I don't think it's exercising disproportionate influence compared to historically loose tensions have, have always have always been there. Uh, on this question of, uh, of race and representation in public life, uh, I think Republicans uh, certainly are really coming to terms that they have a very uh, big problem with uh, historically relying uh, disproportionately on, on, on the white vote. Um, as a Republican, I'm encouraged that there's at least some, uh, some, some public examination and accounting here. But I do think it's just interesting, as a, as a point of fact, to look at um, some of the emerging Republican leaders. So there's only one African-American senator right now, happens to be a Republican, happens to occupy Strom Thurmond's old seat in South Carolina, ironically enough. There are only two Hispanic governors out of 50. They're both Republicans. There are only two Indian-American governors out of 50. They're both Republicans. There are only three Latino senators. Two of them are, are Republicans. Uh, you know, in some ways, maybe some of this starts at the top, but these are all elected, except for the in the case of uh, Tim Scott, who was appointed by the governor, but I think stands a good chance at, at re-election. So the Republican base, even though it's largely white voters, is becoming much more comfortable with voting for people who don't, quote, look like them. Yeah, you've been, you've been waiting patiently. Hi, um, okay, so... Name, name uh, identify. Oh, I'm so sorry, yeah, Richard Gaston from the American University of Sharjah uh, in the United Arab Emirates. Um, Okay, so if you can think historically about, uh, you know, it, uh, Oliver Stone's favorite, uh, John F. Kennedy, as a representative of the uh, staunch anti-communist movement of the 50s and 60s, uh, nowhere near as uh, liberal in foreign policy as possible, then can't you see Obama as sort of representative of the, to my mind, insanity of the war on terror, uh, you know, starting in September 11th, then, and, and apparently these things take 10, 20, 30 years to play out. Um, thus, you know, kind of a sort of a victim, as it were, of this particular um, uh, paradigm that's been set and norm, norm, normalization of, of what we consider to be, um, you know. Uh, so, at any rate, I'll just sort of throw that out there. Absolutely. Unless you want them to answer all the foreign policy. Uh, I've done too much talk about it. Well, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, since the war on terror. <laughs> everyone is terrorized. Yeah. And therefore, even my friends in the ACU call you tell them that uh, people don't want to be critical, too openly critical, or say anything because everybody's scared. And therefore, and that the president doesn't want to be in a position that something happens somewhere and then people say, look what you did! <laughs> because you didn't keep the... So anything that's in place it's sort of like, you know, in D.C. we have closed the street in front of the White House, which has been closed now since the war on terror. They're never going to open it again because nobody will want to risk that they opened it and then something happened. So once all these measures are taken and presidents make decisions to do things, Obama isn't going to write it. I don't know what he thinks in you know, his own head or his mind or his visceral. Uh, but uh, you're exactly right, it's the war on terror. But if you go back to his inaugural address in 2009, where he sounded so aspirational for a different 
Warren policy that I almost worried that he might be charged with being rude to Bush too, who was right in the background. He led us to believe that there was going to be something else. Oh, Laura. <laughs> I, I was, I was, you need to read power and words, uh, the stories behind Obama's speeches in the campaign. Campaigns are about persuading people to vote for you. Inaugurations are about celebration. They are not about, go back and read the inauguration speeches of all the presidents, we're historians. How many of them did the stuff that's in the inauguration speeches? <laughs> Thomas Jefferson said what? We're all Republicans, we're all Democrats, or whatever it was. Abraham Lincoln. Uh, all these people, Abraham Lincoln. You know, whatever they say. <laughs> Don't go and, Abraham Lincoln didn't do everything he said in his inauguration address. And most presidents do not, unless I'm mistaken. Maybe you guys know some people who've done everything they said they were going to do in inauguration speeches. They are for purposes, and you know that, Laura. You're just picking on, you know, trying to make us uh, provoke us. <laughs> I, I've never seen you, I've never seen either of you do that before. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Rhonda Williams, I'm a professor at um, Case Western Reserve University and director of the Social Justice Institute. So my question is about social justice issues. Um, if you could talk about in the historical context to the contemporary period, what this election tells us or shows us about the critical social justice issues of the day, or how different people define that in different ways. If we talk about criminal injustice, if we talk about marginalized and exploited people, if we talk about questions of poverty, um, that move beyond, incorporate, but move beyond the question of values to questions of the economic and political systems and how they must or could change or will they change and where our focus needs to be placed. And so that's the, the first question, the social justice question. The second question is, to what degree can we think about this election in the context of thinking about process and processes of change uh, that are not just focused on kind of episodic moments of uh, elections, uh, where we usually get round up, but on ongoing policies and programs and processes of change and how that needs to take place. And this is provoked by, in a good way, the local and federal uh, conversation that Dr. Mary Frances Berry had for us at the end around voter suppression. Thank you. Okay, so let's start with the implications of this election for how we think about social justice. Well, it wasn't exactly on the table, was it? <laughs> good point. It wasn't exactly on the table. This, this, this election was about uh, taxes. Taxes were on. They, the president went on taxes. It was about fiscal policy. It was about middle class opportunity. It was about Pell Grants. It was about all that stuff that Republicans want to cut. But it wasn't about poverty. I mean, poverty hasn't been on the agenda in the American presidential politics for a very long time. Right? Um, I don't think this did much to change it. Um, I mean, American politics hasn't been there in a very long time. And uh, you know that's something Mary. You know Mary knows a lot more about than I do. But because uh, I've been really poor. <laughs> <laughs> that's one reason. That's one reason. That's one reason. Which is better? But I don't know. <laughs> Does anybody disagree with that? <laughs> so I mean, but no, Mary. No, you're right. Poverty was not on the agenda. Some people tried to raise it, um, and uh, the, the wage gap wasn't on the agenda. The Occupy Movement tried, which you may remember, uh, tried to erase it. The reason why middle class taxes and all that stuff was on the agenda, because that was the targeted voter group. In other words, campaigns are about who we targeting to try to get their vote. And that's why everybody kept saying, middle class, middle class, every 30 seconds. <laughs> And that's because also they know from the focus groups and from the history and from all the rest of it that most people in America think they're middle class. You know, when they think middle class. So when you say that, you get Pavlov's dog. Yeah, middle class. It's after the middle class. And not poor people. When you say poor people, the only people who care about poor people, really, they think, the politicians think, when they come to vote, are poor people and that poor people don't vote in as large numbers, so therefore, let's not talk about poor people. So the only place I think it came out of the election was that moment of the 47% business. Mm -hmm. right. Because there, a Republican view, right, which is that 47% you know, of Americans are takers, and we are the makers. Put everybody... No, not all Republicans. 
<laughs> that, was a moment. that particular Republican at that particular moment. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy to a lot of Republicans. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, you have to, I mean, I, I guess in this discussion, I always like to distinguish between campaign strategy and rhetoric and things that are said and how they fit and what they do and what people substantively are really doing. <laughs> Uh, and in fact, you remember that uh, comment that um, uh, Romney made, I forgot when he made it, that people want to get stuff or yeah, they want right. something, and I guess O'Reilly said it too or something. It is indeed true that people want to get stuff. You know, we may call stuff different things, <laughs> like your social security benefits, <laughs> or whatever it is, but people do want to get it. And it is true that one of the great conundrums in American politics is how do you explain to people that if we're all going to get stuff, the, the good stuff that we all want, how are you going to pay for it? And are there, is there enough money if you tax all these, we say tax the rich, there will be enough money. And that if you add it up, is there really enough money? Uh, and also, what distinguishes a welfare state that we would impose broadly, we almost have it, but not broadly, we'll get, get more of Obamacare, with what has happened to some countries in Europe, and what is it we're doing different. No one has an adult conversation about those things, but it is indeed true that we want stuff. I want stuff. I don't know about you. <laughs> Please. Uh, uh, there was a very unfortunate moment on the Republican side of the campaign when uh, Paul Ryan as a good uh, Jack Kemp protege, wanted to give a major speech uh, on, on poverty, on the Republican vision of empowerment, of upward mobility, uh, of social justice, and the Romney folks squelched it. They just didn't want to talk about that. Uh, that would not have done anything to swing the election, but I thought that was uh, symbolic in a, in a very un unfortunate way. Uh, looking ahead, it is interesting that a couple of the, it's too early to handicap this stuff, but a couple of the early leaders for uh, the Republicans in 2016, Marco Rubio and Paul Ryan, have both already been rolling out uh, empowerment and social justice agendas, again, from the Republican vantage point. This is not to make normative claims on if that stuff will work or not, but that they at least want to speak to these issues and speak to the, speak uh, speak to those those communities. But on the larger point that Mary was making here, I, I, I couldn't agree more. We've got this uh, very interesting uh, domestic consensus in America right now that Americans love low taxes and they love domestic entitlements. Uh, so in that sense, the right has won half the battle. The low, you know, Reagan won the low tax one. You know, we've all agreed. Obama believes it now. He's embracing 98% of the Bush, the vilified Bush Cheney tax cuts. What's up with that? Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the the left, the Democrats have won the the welfare state, um, uh, you know, domestic entitlement program argument. You can't touch those. So if you believe in bipartisan comedy and, and uh, national unity, it's great. We all agree on that stuff. If you believe in any sort of uh, fiscal future for America, it's a nightmare. One, those, those are unsustainable. One is going to have to go, and that's where the debate needs to play out. And on that note, it's noon. I live six blocks from the Capitol, and so the notion of bipartisan comedy is kind of, <laughs> seems kind of foreign to me. Uh, I want to thank... Uh, Bill Cronin for organizing this is a presidential session and I want to emphasize that uh, Mary especially going last with with a story uh, this is especially appropriate to a presidential session at this annual meeting because that's what uh, Bill's presidential address is going to focus on which is on storytelling and the aspect of Rhonda Williams question that the panel did not have time to answer I would argue is that other part of what historians are good at doing which is we understand how change happens and we didn't get to answer that part of the question about how change happens. So that's the kind of thing that maybe you ought to all go away thinking about. And I want to thank all of our panelists uh, and all of you for participating.